Welcome to the Art of Liberty, the unauthorized radical libertarian podcast with George Donnelly and John Tyner. If you want to maximize your freedom in the real world today, this is the podcast for you. Today is July 29th, 2013, and our topic is, what's the next step for the liberty community? Well, hello there, John. Another beautiful morning, isn't it? It is. How are you doing this morning? I am. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a I'm sunny really day, ta- so, so yeah, I think I'll be all it's, right. It's a little overcast here, actually. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm really tired this weekend, but at the same time, I'm feeling really awesome because I finally got out and got to go on a long bike ride for the first time this weekend in a long time. Oh, nice. Nice. And I always tell I always tell people the the thinking that I can get done on my bike is second only to that that I do in the shower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get I, I get some of my best ideas when I'm doing uh, when I'm jogging. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Like I don't know if you're just out there and you just your mind is clear. You're not thinking about anything else. But yeah, it just seems to seems to be really good for that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I saw there was some scientific study that said that you do your best thinking when you're in a warm safe place or something like that and uh, <laughs> that explains the shower i guess <laughs> yeah yeah nice and warm hmm. but yeah I, I know i know i sweat a lot when i'm on my bike so maybe that's got something to do with that as well <laughs> although it's definitely not safe out there <laughs> hmm. yeah yeah i recently bought a mountain bike actually but i haven't and i took it out once i went up this huge mountain i went with some friends and they were like yeah this 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 is this ride is easy and so i'm like oh okay you know so it's a, at first it's a slight incline and i'm like okay i can handle this and then it's like this giant mountain i'm like oh no you know? so they're all like <laughs> flying way ahead of me and i'm there like okay you know just one foot you know and then the other one foot right. and then the other and i actually managed to get way up this 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 and it seriously is a mountain and then i get to the top and they're all they're having their snacks on i'm like all right you know we're done and they're like Psh, we're just barely starting <laughs> and i'm like is it much farther and they're like no nah, no we're almost there and so we start to go downhill again right and i'm like oh okay you know, this part will be easy going back up. I don't know about that, you know, to get home. And, but then 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 we hit this this part where it's like even steeper and before and there are no streets and stuff. It's just gravel. Uh, so I ended up pushing it up quite a ways, um, <laughs> pushing the bike up. And but finally, uh, I got I actually made it to the top. But the and the ride down was super intense. Yeah. Yeah, the mountain biking can be, especially if you got on some single track, like you're just white knuckling it the whole way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Coming it's down. Fu- it's funny. It's, it's like funny that. that you bring that up about your friends because they're. It's been a while since I've seen it, but there was a um, there was a thing floating around. It was like things cyclists say to each other, and one of them was always like, "Oh yeah, it's really easy, no problem." You know. <laughs> There's a bunch of stuff like that. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny that you bring that up. I was watching. I don't know if you're familiar with this show, um, Covert Affairs on USA. No, I haven't heard of it. Mm -mm. It's somebody told me once it's loosely based on Valerie Plame's career in a in the CIA. Hmm. Um, But it basically follows this young girl who works uh, works for the CIA. And their season opener was actually filmed in Medellin. Um, oh, really? I guess it was. Yeah, I think it was last year that they filmed it, but it was just on a couple of weeks ago. And my wife was out of town when it was on, so I didn't catch it till last week. But yeah, I was I was trying to like I saw the place and I was like, this looks like these pictures that I've seen George post like as his cover <laughs> photo on Facebook. <laughs> and then halfway through the episode, they mentioned I was like, did he just say Medellin? And then I actually had to go look it up. Yeah, and it turned out they were there, I think, like last March or something, maybe. Oh, cool. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you knew about that or not. Like, if you no. had seen them there, or been upset by them taking over the town or something like that. No, uh, uh-uh, I didn't hear anything. But I, I don't pay much attention to the daily news. It's, you know, if the if the news in the U.S. is, uh, you know, showing all the worst uh, parts of, of what happens, it's even yeah. worse here. <laughs> it's just openly yellow <laughs> journalism. You know, where they lead with the. Uh, you know, the dead bodies and stuff. It's, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Yeah, yeah. Here it has to be dead before it leads, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So uh, we actually have a question. Can you believe it? I I was surprised. Yeah. Um, listener Michelle. So it sounds like we may actually have a second listener. Um, <laughs> it's not confirmed yet. <laughs> I know we have one whose name is Tom, who's a really great guy. He's always telling me he's listening in his car even. Yeah. So now it looks like we may have a second because I, I, I don't think, think I think we've got a third because I hear from my brother-in-law every once in a while. Oh, OK. All right. That's three. OK, because I don't think Wendy, you know, the one with the, the question on the military. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't think she kept listening. I don't think she liked uh, what we had to Didn't say like very much. Answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, let's listen to that question. It's a little All long. Right. Yeah, it's All about right. three minutes. All right. Hello, George and John. This is Michelle Santos. I wanted to chime in on a discussion that the two of you had a few weeks back about libertarianism and selfishness. And the specific issue was John was bringing up a line of argument, which I like a lot, but which George was criticizing because he thought it can fall on deaf ears. And I, I also agree with George because uh, sometimes I've seen that line of argument fall on deaf ears. So specifically, the line of argument was, let's say you're at your home and two people come over to your house or home and they say, well, hi, we're here to take your TV. And you say, no, I don't think so. And then they say, well, there's a TV here in the community. It would be really selfish for you to keep it. And we've got better plans for the TV. We can help lots of, lots of kids uh, learn something better. And the reason that George was bringing up the point that this is um, uh, touches on really a second issue about private property. And I think there's a lot of people who either explicitly or implicitly reject the idea of private property. And so there, you're, I think you're touching on two issues. And I, I'd propose to adjust the line of argument so that you remove the idea of private property and can focus on what I think is the more critical issue. So here's an alternate line of argument that I'd be curious to see what you think of. Uh, what if you're at home, two people come to your home, and they say, hi, we're here to beat you up, or hi, we're here to physically abuse you to keep this family friendly. And of course, you reject the idea, and they say, well, we're philosophical people. Why don't we hold a vote on whether or not to do that? And and clearly, you know, they have the majority. They could win that vote, and then they could go ahead and do what they want to you. But that's that's part of the problem, right? It, it the issue, of course, is in this case the outcome, and it highlights the point that simply holding a vote can, you know, simply holding a vote doesn't make the outcome of the vote legitimate or moral. And I think that's the point that needs to be highlighted: that holding the vote itself is possibly immoral. Sure, you can hold a vote where everybody agrees to honor the outcome of the vote result, but that's not what we're talking about here. I think we're talking about holding a vote where uh, holding a vote where not everybody has agreed to it in the first place, and that's the issue that needs to be attacked. And uh, then people might make excuses about you know holding a vote that there's social contract and so on. But I think if they say you know, if they go on to a, whole, a line of argument that you implicitly agreed to the vote and that you, well, actually, you can't reject the idea of holding a vote, then, you know, we can hide, you know, we can highlight to them what they really are, which is that they don't respect us as individuals. That, but that's a whole other issue. So I would be interested in hearing what the two of you thought. Take care. All right. So I think the, the it sounds like what he's saying is that you know, I definitely like the part where he said that he agreed with my line of argument. <laughs> but it seemed like his point was that private property itself is kind of a contentious topic. And the people you're having the argument with um, about the best use of your stuff, is, you know, you may they may not agree with the idea of private property. Um, mm. And his, his solution to this was kind of to go back and say, okay, well, maybe we don't agree on private property. So... You know, there's three of us here in the example he gives. So let's have a vote, you know, and that's that seems like a fair way to do it. Um, and ultimately, it came down to I think he was his argument was that we should attack the idea that. That you even agreed to the vote in the first place. I mean, I think the example he gave 
comes up short in that in that respect just because it seemed like the the guy who was about to get beat up had to agree or did agree to that vote but i think under the idea of taxes what he's saying is why don't you argue that you're not bound by this vote or you know you haven't you haven't voluntarily agreed to it Mm -hmm. yeah i i think that that you know in certain situations that can be um a solid argument that's kind of like a spooner that makes me think of Spooner, although I can't remember something that Spooner said about that. Um, but I think that, you know, in the example that he said, I think it's a little bit dangerous to, uh, uh, you know, to to say, OK, you don't believe in private property. Well, let's put it up for a vote. I think that combination for me is a little bit dangerous because um, I don't think that I don't think that voting, you know, I don't know. It's let's see. I don't think, you know, I think private property definitely has kind of a sacrosanct place. Uh, I think some ANCAPs and other types of a- a capitalists take it way too far because there's a lot of absentee ownership that I don't think is um, is legit and it will not be sustained uh, without uh, aggression. Do you, so what do you propose for absentee to avoid that problem? Um. I guess I don't understand. I mean, what's the idea? You need to continue to mix your labor with the land in order to continue to own the property, or yeah, more or less. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not really comfortable with the idea of absentee ownership. Um, I think that if you can secure, you know, if you can convince, let's say you 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 start a factory and you're like, okay, um, you know, I worked on this factory and I created it, but now. I'm going to just go and live in the country and relax and, hey, you take over, you know, and just send me the profits every month. Um, <laughs> you know, I it's think a sweet that, gig. Yeah. I, I think that if, if you can convince people to do that uh, for you, well, I mean, that might be slightly exploitative, but it, but it may not be aggressive. But I, I don't think you're going to be able to do that absent all the protections of the state. So I think that if you if you leave there and then there's no state, well, well, I mean, I think the people who are left have, uh, you know, a, a decent claim to to saying that, you know, you abandoned that and, and they're going to take it over and run it for their own good. Yeah, I, I don't agree, but I think there's a whole show or episode we could do on this. So I don't, I don't really want to get into it too far. I was just curious what your idea was on that. Well, I, I think it's relevant here because um you know i think it's i think it's interesting but the the best argument i've seen for private property is that basically it's a way for people to avoid conflict and i think what you're suggesting you know kind of destroys that idea well i don't know why why does why do you think that you know private property uh you know helps people avoid because i think that if there's absentee private property that just creates more conflict it, it, or at least it, it has well, the potential. Yeah, the sense the sense that I understand that it that it avoids conflict is you know if you've got two people arguing over you know you got two kids arguing over a ball that they both want to play with you know it's well who does it belong to or who had it first kind of thing that's you know so whoever found it first basically homesteaded it kind of thing um, and then that person becomes the owner of it and at that point there can't be there can't be a conflict that isn't easily resolved kind of thing. Like it belongs to whoever the first one is that found it. And so from then on, basically they're, they're a dictator as far as that ball goes. And legitimately so is kind of the idea. It's, it's funny. It's funny because when I was a kid growing up in Philadelphia, we had issues like this. Uh, there was a whole bunch of us who played on this, this street and we would find actually find balls sometimes. Like we would go into this the the sewer grates, and there would be like tons of balls down there of all different right. kinds. And we would fish them Baseballs out. Baseballs and stuff that just rolled down there. Yeah, yeah, tennis balls. You know the the rubber balls that bounced and uh, oh, yeah, racket balls. All yeah, all kinds of stuff. And that stuff that was like the the mother load for us because we were pl- always playing all kinds of ball games in the street. Right. And we would always lose the balls eventually. Um, so Especially other kids could find them balls. in the grate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it was like our resupply, and uh, and so and so it would be like you know, it, it was always it was at least a two person job to fish balls out, and then sometimes it would be like you know, okay, he's the one who you know stuck his arm in and got it, 
And then, but then he had to go home and then we played it and then I held on to it for six months. And then he's like, Hey, where's that ball? You know, and I really wanted that. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I've been using it for six months, you know? And so it's cre I mean, even, even your, you know, example can lend itself to conflicts because, you know, he, he may have been the one who found it or the one who fished it out, but maybe, you know, I've been taking care of it for six months. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think in that situation, there's not, there's not a whole lot to lose by arguing over a ball that's found under the grate. So in that case, you know, the guy who fished it out might just be like, all right, well, you're right. You held on to it for six months. You know, I'm gonna, I'll just find another one. You know, in the factory example, that guy's got a lot of money at stake there. Like, He's not just going to leave you in charge of it for six months without putting in some kind of agreement before he leaves. Yeah, but I mean, it's more than there may be a whole factory full of workers, too, and who all and all, it may be that all of us were there uh, the whole time, you know, during the uh, creation and the building up of the factory as well. Yeah, but are they, you know, I mean, we can take this argument in any number of directions. I mean, were they putting money in, you know, to, you know, capital to build this building and acquire the the means of production, as it were? You know, what I mean, well, maybe that, you know, you could argue that they are part of the means of production. I suppose, but they're supposedly being paid for their work, right? Otherwise, they probably wouldn't be there. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, your I think your perspective is a pretty pure capitalist one. And, I, I, probably, I would I wouldn't and, dispute that. <laughs> and I know some ANCAPs who are who if they were listening to this would be like, You communist, how dare you? <laughs> you know, George is a pinko. But I you know, I think mine is 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 what I is closer to what I would call a mutualist. Um and I you know, I don't I'm not I don't completely agree with that thing, but just because the capitalists got together the money or whatnot. Um, that, you know, he, that the owner, that the workers don't have any stake in it. Yeah. But I think that that's something the workers should have brought up when they first started working there. You know, it's not something that they go, okay, we're going to come work for you for money. And then this guy finally gets rich enough that he decides to move to Barbados or wherever and just watch the profits roll in. And then these people decide, hey, we don't like the fact that this guy made a bunch of money. We're just going to take over his factory. Well... You know, I mean, to me, that seems like something that needs to be set up from the beginning to have any legitimacy. Well, they may have come in without really knowing what they were getting themselves into or well, without really being own, conscious of what was going on. Isn't that their fault? Well, then you could say that, you know, when, for example, when I signed up for selective service and I didn't really know what I was getting into that, you know, so you could be like, oh, you were drafted or you, you, you did, you know, you signed up with the state. So, I mean, that's your problem now, you know. But I didn't well, know. I didn't know the state was an aggressive monopoly. Sorry, well, but you should well, have one, figured that out ahead of time, right? I think it, and that well, in that particular case, I think well, I think the idea that you should have known ahead of time is probably valid there. I mean, I remember when I signed up for it, I was deathly afraid I was going to be drafted. You know, there wasn't really any wars going on, but my thought was, you know, I don't have any interest in serving in the military and, you know, I've got to sign up for this thing. But the second thing I was going to say is that's kind of a bad example because that thing's enforced by, you know, with aggressive force. I mean, that's kind of the thing is if you don't sign up, we're going to come make you sign up. Although some, um, you know, big uh, absentee property owners have um, benefited from uh, aggression in order to accumulate their assets. In in what way? I mean, uh, I, what I'm not I'm not defending that, I guess, is. You know, well, for I'm not, I mean, I'm not defending that. I mean, you know, I mean, it's pretty well accepted that all, the the biggest guys are there in Washington conspiring to get the laws written in ways that favor them. Right. Um, so they have I'm greater about, access to to Fed financing. You know, sure. So like I'm talking. I'm talking about pure capitalism. You know, I'm, I'm at least I thought you think I am. You know, I'm not talking about what these guys do to lobby the state to protect their businesses. That's that's wrong, in my opinion. Mm hmm. <laughs> so I mean that then in that case I absolutely agree with you they're using the state to uphold their their businesses. Yeah. But I don't think that I don't think that what we're talking about up until now requires the state or involves them at all. You know, I mean you can have private property or a society based upon one and I don't think that's necessarily requires aggressive state action. Mhm. Mm yeah. Yeah, you may be right. So anyway, back to Michelle's question. Um I I think 
I I like what he's I like what he's getting at, but I don't think that that argument holds any water for people who think that they have access to your private property in the first place. <laughs> I mean, in in the bulk of the, you know, in current society here in the states, people are going to argue we've got this constitution and you can either agree with it and abide by it or you can find your way out. Love it or leave it, baby. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've I've been told that one a few times. Yeah, and I and I think that's that's people's uh that's the reaction that pro people have been programmed um to give, you know. Well, you don't like it, you don't like how it works here, well love it or leave it, you know. Go to right. Somalia. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and one of the one of the other things he said too is, you know, if these people don't don't agree with that, then they're going to demonstrate that they don't respect you as an individual or more generally individualism at all. And I was gonna say that's exactly right. They don't. <laughs> hmm. I don't think you probably have any argument from them on those grounds. Otherwise, they wouldn't try and be coming to try and take your TV for the quote unquote greater good. Yeah. I mean, there definitely is a class of people out there. I, they don't worry me that much, um, but they're, they're out there and they think that um, they can do whatever they like and take whatever they like. And, um, you know, the, the, those, those people actually, in my opinion, cross all kinds of ideological boundaries. There are thugs on, on all sides. There are even thugs in the, uh, in the liberty community, in my opinion. Yeah, there's, they're just, in general, it seems like humans have a ends justify the means kind of idea somewhere in the back of their mind. Yeah. You know, if they believe their, their ends are good or just or right, then it doesn't matter how they get there for the most part. Yeah, it, it, maybe it's like a caveman streak, you know. Me hungry, you give me food. <laughs> right. <You know? laughs> I must have food. I don't yeah. care about anything else. <laughs> so before we get to the main topic, I had a couple quick stories that caught my eye. Okay. Um, in the news. So we've been talking about HOAs off and on. Hmm. And ours dealt with this problem, but there was, I guess, I think I told you there's a newsletter that comes out here in California that I read every week. Mm -hmm. And... They actually talked about this, and the state passed some kind of law that says if you've got a pool in your common area, you have to hang a sign. And let me read the, the actual code to you real quick because it's kind of funny. It says, a sign in letters at least one inch high and in a language or a diagram, remember diagram, <laughs> that is clearly stated shall be posted at the entrance of a public pool which states that persons currently having active diarrhea or who have had active <laughs> diarrhea within the previous 14 days shall not be allowed to enter the pool water. <laughs> so our HOA we just went through this and had to actually post this sign. Um, but this Wait. newsletter, somebody somebody just wrote in, and it's not from, I don't think it's from our HOA, but it, there's they wrote in and they're like, we just saw this sign and like we think it's in bad taste. Like, can we get our HOA to stop this? And the guy who writes the newsletter basically came back and said, nope, this is a state thing and you have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I'd love to see the diagram. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're about to get in the pool and you got this picture of however you want to describe it. <laughs> I have active diarrhea. <laughs> so the, the other one I saw just last night was um, some guy at Google won some prize from the NSA. Um, and they apparently mm. held this science of security competition. And I don't know if he entered or how he got involved with it, but he wrote some paper about passwords. And um, I'm not sure exactly what it was. The article I found just says he wrote a paper on the nature of passwords. Mm -hmm. And the NSA gave him some science of security competition award for mm -hmm. this paper. Mm hmm. And apparently the next day he wrote a blog post, which basically says, I don't think the NSA is fit to exist, at least in its current form. <laughs> poor NSA. <They're> just, <laughs> yeah, poor NSA. <laughs> they're just everybody's whipping dog, you know, whipping post or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. So yeah, here's this guy who won this award and, and had the good sense to be like, these people are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the there was an attempt to uh, defund the NSA in the House of Representatives? I did see that. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, I, I was, I'm not surprised it failed. I was actually more surprised that it got as many votes that it, as it did. Yeah. No, but here, here's the part. Here's the, the part that makes me like facepalm, as I so love to do, is <laughs> that um, because it, it had so much success, now there will be a certain group of people who will lose the next three to four uh, years of their lives trying to defund the NSA, you know, just, just like there are so many people, you know, who are like audit the Fed, you know, and years and years of audit the Fed and nothing came of it, really. 
Oh, so like, you mean like people in Congress, like they're like, this thing's so close. Like if we just focus all our attention on it, we can make it happen. Well, even people in the liberty community. Oh, uh, you mean like primarily. Activism kind of, yeah, activism yeah. So, kind of I mean, how long until we have the shirts, you know, defund the NSA, you know, <laughs> and, and Rand Paul up there, you know, hey, we got to defund the NSA, support me and send me money. And Maybe uh, we can get some kind of Pink Floyd tie in for the shirts, you know, because of the prism and everything. <laughs> But it's 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 just a huge waste of time. It, you know, if if you happen to be uh, listening to this and you plan to defund the NSA, let, let me just tell you that's a complete waste of your time, because even if you know a miracle was pulled off and uh, it passed the uh, House and the Senate and the the president signed it, uh, the, and they actually. uh, disbanded the NSA, well, they'll they'll just pass that function to a different agency like the CIA or military intelligence or something and continue right along doing it. Yeah, there's all all kinds of NSA. There's all all kinds of other agencies within the government that you just don't even hear about. You know, every time one of them comes out of the woodwork, they just create a new one. Yeah, I mean, it's... So, like, there's another one that I've heard about called the National Reconnaissance Organization. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't hear a lot about them. But if you look like, I mean, they're listed on like, I think they're listed on Wikipedia and stuff, but you just don't hear about them kind of thing. So as soon as they come out of the woodwork, then they just create a new one and all the uber secret stuff goes off to there. Yeah, I mean, it's a shell game, you know, and if you if you're, you know, if you're always trying to to cut off the littlest tentacle of the of the beast, I mean, you know, even if you succeed, I mean, he's got a million other tentacles. Yeah. Well, and what's what's interesting to me um, about that as well is that NSA is not I mean, they're not following the law as it's currently understood anyway. And Obama's going around making this argument. And I think Bush, you know, he, it started back with Bush and probably before that. I didn't follow politics very closely before then. But they're basically arguing, you know, this stuff's national security and you don't have standing to even, you know, for uh, you don't even have standing to find out whether or not we're even doing this thing. You know, like basically the judiciary has no business even looking into what we're doing in this regard. (laughs) So, I mean, the idea that you're going to pass some law that says thou shalt not do this and the executive's not just going to go off and do it and then hide behind this. It's national security. You know, we don't even have to tell you whether or not it's going on, I think is naive at best. Hmm. It's um, that that's going to be, you know, all, all this police state in the surveillance state is going to be with us until uh, we end this government so long one way or another. Exists. Yeah, I mean, we'll find ways around it and whatnot. But I mean, it's it's a constant battle. It always has been. And until we change the paradigm, I mean, it's going to be with us and you're not you're not going to be able to defund it. You know, you're not going to be able to. To audit it, you I mean, at best you, you know, like the the whole court strategy with the uh, TSA, at best, you know, you'll, you'll, I mean, the best thing that it seems that they were able to get the TSA to do was to hold a public comment period, which right. is, uh, you know, whether that actually has any practical effect or not, uh, re- certainly remains to be seen, but I'm not um, optimistic about it. Yeah, probably not in the law. I mean, I think the best thing all of these things have have going for them is just the fact that they've drawn public attention to them. Yeah, and, although, you know, like the problem is then those people direct their energy back into getting the state to to, you know, stop doing these things to them. Right, right. Instead you know, of got, engaging this, in direct action. Right. Yeah. You've got this guy, you know, doing stuff, you know, aggressing against you and then you go to him like oh well can you please stop i mean i have no power other than to ask you to stop but <laughs> mm. yeah exactly. well it's almost kind of a stockholm syndrome kind of thing you know i think that it that is actually the case i think there is a huge a massive stockholm syndrome uh situation going on um because i mean i was raised to believe that the government was you know my 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 protector and the cop was my friend you know and all that stuff and uh, I think so is everybody else. And in, it's not just in school. I mean, school is the least of it. It's on TV. I mean, it permeates the culture. Um, right. And by design. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I probably, I mean, I, but I don't know, but probably. And so it's so hard to get away from it, um, you know, and, and so many people, 
uh, have these work situations where they work all day and then they get home and people are so atomized, so separate now because we live in this modern way instead of the, you know, an old kind of communal, <gasps> did he say communal, communal <laughs> village way, you know, and so everybody's atomized and separate and whatnot. And so there's no, com there's very little community life, you know, and so everybody's right. stuck in front of their TV eating up the propaganda, you know. So, yeah, I agree. So this seems like a good place to transition into the main topic. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think agree. we're kind of headed that direction anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so let's see. On Thursday, <clears throat> excuse me. On Thursday, I asked my Facebook friends. I said, "What's missing in order for you to achieve your vision of a peaceful libertarian and/or egalitarian society? What is most needed to realize your vision of the stateless society? What's the next step? What do we need right now? Yeah." Yeah. What do you think? Um, I, I was, this was one of the reasons I was actually glad, um, that I got to go out and ride. Cause that's, like I said, it's, I could just have a time to think. Um, and so one of the things I came up with, or I was thinking about was, um, recently here in town, you know, the city collects all the trash kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it used to be, you could just put out whatever trash can you wanted. Um, and but people who had gotten their trash cans from the local company that's been contracted to pick it up, like you know, they're kind of a special design so that the truck could pick it up easily rather mm. than the guy having to get out of the truck and toss it in there. Uh huh. So I bought one of these cans from Home Depot here um, and started using it. And it cost me like 65 bucks or something like that, but it was a big can, and you know, the trash guy can pick it up with his truck. Mm -hmm. So I think last year or so, the city came around and basically said, well, I mean, this company sent it out, but they've essentially got the, the backing of the force of government because they're a monopoly in the area. Um, they came out and they said, all right, we're not going to take any trash cans, but the ones we provide for you anymore. Wow. Yeah. So we're going to bring you those trash cans. And they're quote unquote free. You know, you get them as part of the service. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to take anything else. So here I am out this 65 bucks um, for this trash can, which is perfectly good and shaped exactly like the ones they provided me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but they won't take mine. Um, so anyway, that's just been kind of stewing in the back of my mind. And I thought, you know what? I wonder if I could get some of my neighbors, you know, what, what would happen if I got a truck and I decided to pick up my neighbor's trash um, you know, maybe 10 or 12 of them. Cause you know, I'm one guy right now mm -hmm. and haul it down to the dump. You know, I wonder if I could drop off their trash there for like, you know, four or five bucks kind of thing and then charge my, you know, cause I think my neighbors get charged like 20 bucks a month for trash collection. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, well, what if I could collect like 15 or 18 a month from them and haul it down to the dump for, you know, some lesser amount of money kind of thing. And maybe I can get like a couple of my neighbors involved and we all just do it on a Saturday kind of thing you know so maybe there's not a whole lot of profit but it only costs us all a couple hours out of our week but we all save 20 bucks kind of thing a month mm -hmm. so anyway i that was kind of the one one of the things i had i had in mind and is just kind of an agorist activity like that but i think i like the one specifically that try and take that try and usurp city services mm. or government services yeah because a lot of a, a lot of the answers that we got were kind of let's reform the government let's let's go start our own. There was one guy who was like, let's move off to somewhere and just start our own kind of liber libertarian utopia. Ah, uh, yeah. And I don't think those will work. You can't just set that up in a vacuum kind of thing. It hmm. seems like there needs to be other services, and you kind of need to be ready for it. You can't just go and be like, all right, we're a stateless society. Go. Yeah. All right, so hey, so let's read some of these. So, uh, so actually, yeah, uh, my friend James Cox, uh, he said, "Land. What we need is land to build a private, peaceful, voluntarist community." Yeah, and so that that was kind of that was the one I was talking about, and you know, so like when I hear that, my first the, my first thought reading that was like Ruby Ridge or Waco, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So you get these crazies kind of living on the land, kind of by themselves, and. You know, my first thought was, well, you'd have to get a lot of land underneath you to actually set up like a, you know, a decent sized society. I mean, I guess you could have people living in like a little community, but in that case, you don't really need a lot of land or a lot of people. 
So it was my my thing was kind of either you can't get enough land to get out from under the government, you know, the nearest government. And if you do get enough land, you're not just going to like I said, I don't think you can just be like stateless society. Go, you know, you need a bunch of infrastructure and stuff kind of under under you to get started with that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'm not sure. You know, on the one hand, I, I like that idea. And on the other hand, um, I you know, I just think uh, I have some concerns about it because, you know, it may not necessarily work out well and it may turn into the kind of situation where uh, there was recently, maybe a year or so ago, uh, some communists who set up a commune to prove that, you know, communism would, would work oh, really? for them. Yeah. And it failed. It's <laughs> None of them could get a log. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, and and they're always fighting about who, which thing belonged to which person, um, which is just a little bit ironic. But, right. Um, so did they set up the Politburo to decide? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think they just broke up. I'm not sure. Well, so, it seems like in James's case, I mean, he could just move to New Hampshire and become part of the Free State Project. I mean, assuming he's not already. Yeah. No, I don't. I mean, think that's kind has, of that idea, right? But I know he's involved a little bit with the Free State Project. Yeah. yeah a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think there is there is a project like this that's interesting to me. Uh, it's called I think it's called Freedom Orchard. It's mm-hmm. in Chile, and um, basically um, they bought up a or no, it was already a, it was a bunch of land that somebody owned there, and he wants to sell it off in plots to um, to people who can you know build homes and whatnot there, and so it'll be like an enclosed community. Um, of in the ideas that these are going to be people from other places, not not from Chile, and okay. it's it's pretty land is is um it starts around ninety thousand dollars for a decent sized plot, which is probably enough for for a decent house and and for a nice sized garden, um, and uh, you know I'm partial to Latin America, so I'm I'm interested in that project, um, and they're they're doing some decent marketing. I'm pretty sure it's called Freedom Orchard. You can Google it. Yeah, is this a place you you posted a comment or something on their Facebook page a couple weeks ago or something right about the naming or something like that? Yeah, yeah, because there's there's this other project <laughs> uh, by uh, the guy. What's his name? Behind the know. dollar vigilant vigilante. Oh, and, um, Jeff Berwick is that him? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's his, or he's involved in it, and they're calling it Galt's Gulch. Oh, okay. And my my impression is that Galt's the Galt's Huh? Galt's Gulch is well. It's also in Chile, but my impression is that it's some kind of you know high roller setup uh, there in Chile, and uh, it's probably expensive. That's just I, ha- I haven't really looked into it because for whatever they're, they're reason. actually trying to get all the captains of industry to move there and <laughs> and withdraw their their productive use from society. Ah, yeah. And yeah, so, no, I, I, only, yeah. I only brought it up because Freedom Orchard. When I saw you post on there, I never thought I never looked into either one of them, and I thought Freedom Orchard was actually some kind of like fruit growing, <laughs> libertarian, <laughs> you know, fruit pro- provider grower kind of thing. No, but so Freedom, I'm glad you I'm glad you talked about it. <laughs> yeah, Freedom Orchard seems to be. There's a guy I know from Philadelphia. Well, no second hand named Frank uh, Sabo. I think you pronounce his last name who seems like a, a decent guy and he's the one he's like they hired him to do the marketing and he's he has like video walkthroughs and whatnot and the prices are not insane um i think they're 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 reasonable and so it looks it looks promising to me um you know if i had a spare ninety thousand dollars i i might just buy some land there and uh you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah if we all the world would be a better place if we all had a spare ninety thousand dollars sitting around <laughs> Well, actually, that that's funny because I think that um, I think that most of us would would misspend it, frankly. Probably, it's it's like because I think most people don't know how to handle money, and I I count myself among them. Um, you know, nobody ever teaches you in school how to handle money, and so it's like those people who win the lottery, and then you know, like a year later, they're five million dollars in debt. <laughs> Yeah, the other way. Yeah, they were better off without that money. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it, I think that's a tragedy too. But but anyway, so so another response that we got was from Philippe Nikolai Dashwood, who's from France, and he says, "We need a true globalized entrepreneurship culture. 
um, all kinds of, you know, preneurship, crowdpreneurship, intrapreneurship, you know. So yeah, he, he didn't he didn't write a whole lot with this comment, but I think it was actually my favorite one. Oh yeah, I think that one. Yeah, well, like I said, I, I I'm kind of I think one because I think that we need to start providing, like we talked about last week, you know, like with arbitration and stuff. Um, start providing businesses that the government typically monopolizes in the private sector. And I think once we start doing that and people see that those can work, you know, the system, you know, basically becomes once people see it works, they'll start to follow it. Hmm. So that was kind of that was kind of the reason I liked this answer was that, you know, you need to get more people doing this kind of stuff and hopefully absent the state to the extent possible. Yeah. You know, basically start existing without the state kind of thing and ho let it wither away, which I think is a phrase you've used a number of times in past episodes. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are some people who think that uh, we have to find a little corner of the world and kind of, you know, clear out all the status dust and make it nice and pretty and clean. And in that little corner, we're going to uh, make um you know the the revolution or the evolution happen and perhaps from there it'll spread out but um and that's that's behind ideas like the free state project and the private peaceful voluntarist community and the people who like to work on that you know i, I think you should because um you know everybody should follow their passion and you know i'm sure that some good things will come of that but frankly i think that uh we need to build um the agorist evolution in place, you know, wherever we already are, uh, taking advantage of all the different resources that we have at hand, you know, in all the different contexts where we live. And we need to start businesses and it needs to kind of grow organically within the status context. Yeah, that I agree. <laughs> I don't have anything <laughs> to add to that. So here's a, a comment from Corey Moore. He says, we need an influx of capital both in monetary form and human form. This is necessary to build the counter economy. Um, and as a side note, he says a bunch of people selling drugs, toys, and candy aren't cutting it. I believe he says the top priorities should be real private defense agencies, food production, and industrial output, and of course, better marketing. I like that you mentioned marketing since that's kind of what you see yourself as doing. Yeah. <laughs> I got a kick out of that. Yeah, I like, I like, I like this comment too. Um, I think that's kind of in the, along the same entrepreneurship vein, but he actually mentions agorism specifically. Yeah. Um, I thought, I thought that private defense, at least in the, in the, um, the sense that we talked about it last week, you know, with hired goons coming to your house kind of thing to mm -hmm. collect your stolen TV. I think that's a little bit further down the road in my mind. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, like I said, with me living here in California and the gun laws and stuff like that being as strict as they are. Um, I think those are further down the road. I think if you try to do that right now, you just get arrested on the spot and that would be the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> but like, I think he mentioned food production though, which I think is a good idea. Like other, you know, other things that are less overt, at least at the present time. Hmm. You know, here in uh, Colombia, they have an interesting uh, private a system of really what are private defense agencies, which I think that we can learn a lot from. Uh, basically, here the government is woefully underfunded, or should I say, cheerfully underfunded? Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say, if only that was the case everywhere else. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so the you know there for many many years, uh, you don't you never saw police on the streets. You didn't you don't see police running around in their police cars and whatnot. Um, that has changed slightly in the last few years after. Uh, Uribe got into power, uh, who was, you know, practically, he was practically Colombia's Fujimori. And, um, and so now you see more police around for better or for worse, but this, uh, this system. So basically what happened is because there were never any police around these, um, private security agencies sprung up and there are a whole bunch of them. And several of them are, uh, to my delight, co-ops. And so you have these individuals who are trained in security, and they have the whole uniform. Uh, some of them are actually armed with uh, pistols or shotguns. Um, you know, they have flashlights and, I mean, the whole deal. They even have badges. And you hire them. And so, for example, if you live in a gated community like I do, 
you hire an agency and they send in maybe five or six guys who rotate around the clock and they set up the whole private security system and they do their rounds and they flash their flashlights and they're really polite and helpful. And, um, and they, they monitor who comes in and who goes out. And, uh, or I've also seen situations where if it's just an open, you know, block situation where there's no gate, then they hire a guy to walk around the block all the time, constantly, or go around on his bike and to carry a shotgun. And all the different blocks, you know, have these guys. And so they're a permanent, you know, what you would call in the U.S., uh, a cop on the beat. I mean, they're right. permanently there. They're always there. And they're always watching. And they, they are an effective deterrent. And there are competing agencies, and even some of them are cooperatives owned by the very guys who are doing the job. Um, and I love this. I love this because these guys are, are really helpful. They're not – even when I go to a, to a different place and I can tell that you know because they don't know me, they're a little bit suspicious of me, even then, they're, they're polite. I mean, they're right. like, they're, they're not like shine, you know, stop, you know, halt, you know, shine the light in your eyes and get out on, on the ground, you know, and point. they're yeah. not like that. They're not like that. They're like, Hey, how you doing? You know, that, that's, that's their way of like, you know, are you friend or foe, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and I, I say, let, let Corey think I'm being too harsh on him. You know, the, the more you're talking about this, that the, the private defense agencies actually do exist here. Um, you don't see them outside of like gated communities or banks or anything like that. But like our HOA, we have a place um, that comes in and they they don't do nearly the they don't have nearly the level of service like what you're talking about where I am. They drive through like five or six times a day mm -hmm. and just basically just drive through the community. But the way the laws are here, it's not clear to me what they're able to do other than tow cars away because the laws are such that they can't carry any kind of weapons for their own defense or anything. Hmm. So, I mean, they can kind of show up at a party and be like, hey, break it up. But, you know, the laws are kind of such that, you know, if the people don't break it up, these guys can't really do anything except then call in the police. Yeah. But it would be interesting to see, um, you know, what what the limits are in the different jurisdictions and how close to a setup like like exists in Colombia, how close people could get to that in the U.S., I personally, at, at least at this stage, I don't want to have anything to do with managing people who are walking around with guns. Um, right. But I'm sure that there are people who are, you know, have the appropriate experience qualifications that are interested in that. And it would be interesting, you know, but I, I do still think it's a little bit early for that because it would, you know, you have to go through a whole huge permitting process and... Uh, you know, in the background check, if they're like, hey, this guy is an anarchist and he said that he wants to, uh, you know, overthrow the government. I mean, that's probably going to disqualify you, <laughs> you know, uh, although well, they, you're they did give the FFL to, set up to that to the guy uh, in, who's doing defense distributed. So, yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, I don't know how I don't know. He came out as a full blown anarchist before he, they gave that to him. But um. But to Corey, to the private defense point, I was going to say, if you're setting up a private defense agency, you might already be an anarchist yourself. So you might not be concerned about hiring a guy who claims to be an anarchist as well. <laughs> <laughs> but and I also think Corey's point about the influx of capital is um, is well taken. I'm reading a book right now called Your Life, Your Legacy, which examines um, the different uh, lives of some of the most successful entrepreneurs in the last hundred years. And you can see how in different situations, um, for example, Richard Branson of, uh, you know, the whole uh, panoply virgin of virgin right? brands, yeah, <laughs> how he, uh, he started his businesses and he grew them up, but cash flow was always uh, like really hard for him. And only when he got an influx of capital um, was he able to like... Uh, step back from kind of like making sure the bills were paid on a daily basis to doing some really neat stuff like like what he, like his airline and his um, the mobile phone thing and the space now the space thing Virgin Galactic yeah <laughs> now that's a brand name that I hope stays around a long time because that's pretty cool <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, we have another comment from my friend Jared he says. Um, we need easily ported encrypted payment using decentralized currency. 
And the moment Joe Sixpack can pay Billy Beer Buyer in something like Bitcoin or its <laughs> derivatives and not have feds know about it, and Billy can deposit it, transfer it, spend it at Amazon, whatever, all without giving their tax evasion a second thought, it's game over. Government may be a construct, but it needs to be funded with faith as much as money. The moment I can scan a card or type a key into my phone, buy food with a BTC-like money, and taxes themselves become uncollectible. That's it. Yeah, I, I like this comment because I think that money is at the root of a lot of problems with the state. Mm -hmm. You know, like he says, you know, if you can, if you can, basically the whole idea of starve the beast, you know, if you can withdraw your funds from the state, um, then that's going to severely hamper its ability to get anything done. I mean, the Fed notwithstanding. Yeah, that's, that's my problem with that line because uh, they'll just uh, fund themselves via uh, inflation, via you well, know, printing more money. Yeah, and I think he, I think he kind of addresses that not, not very, um, not very specifically, but I think he addresses that in the with the faith comment. You know, if people move to some other different money, then Federal Reserve notes aren't going to have a lot of value for the people that the state tries to buy its things from. Hmm. Um, my problem, my problem with this comment is that I don't see that Bitcoin solves problems that cash doesn't. I mean, the problem isn't that. The government can see where your cash is going. The problem is that the government is all up in in the seller's business, uh, yeah. you know, forcing them to report their returns and that kind of stuff. And for these people, it's just more profitable for them to follow the law than to try and evade taxes. So right. in, in the context of his comment, Bitcoin doesn't solve this problem either. Right, because even now we see all these different new uh, Bitcoin startups that are um, engaging with the full state machinery for compliance, you know. Right, and in my mind, that's even worse because now the government's actually watching the money be transmitted. It's kind of like a credit card. You know, they can watch it because it's bits. You know, in my mind, cash is better than all of these things hmm. because there's no electronic record for anybody to follow. Hmm. I mean, you, you literally don't, there's nothing associated with you. I mean, Bitcoin, you've got some kind of unique user ID. You know, maybe people don't know that user ID belongs to you. But if you take your cash and go down to the store and you buy a bottle of whatever, I mean, if you don't give that guy your name and you manage to hide your face from whatever security cameras he's got going on, I mean, at least as far as the transaction goes, there's no, there's no identifying information there at all. But that doesn't solve the tax problem because the the seller is the guy who's going to end up paying that tax to the government. Yeah. So, I mean, from the consumer's mind, he's avoiding taxes because he's not telling the government that he bought this thing. But the seller has priced the tax into the price of whatever goods he's buying. Mm -hmm. Well, and You know, and like his, his last thing about using your phone kind of thing or a card or whatever to scan, like that all exists. Yeah. Not everybody accepts the uh, Bitcoin, but yeah, I mean, the infrastructure like said, is there. Yeah, for, as far as his comment goes, I think Bitcoin is the same as a credit card in this situation. You know, it's a card that you take in and you hand over to them. But the government, you know, like I said, in my mind, a credit card or Bitcoin in this sense is actually worse than cash. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, and even the blockchain um, can be read. I mean, it's it's open information. And, you know, you can look up addresses i mean uh at least some of my addresses are posted on uh websites so you know you can just google that and like okay that address belongs to him you know yeah so like i said that's that's kind of the problem you know I've, and i've actually seen people say you know if you want to be anonymous you kind of have to set up two three or more bitcoin accounts and one of them's kind of your public one and the other one you never associate with yourself Hmm. Although one nice feature is with one account, you can set up uh, basically an unlimited number of, you know, aliases, you know, different addresses. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't use Bitcoin, so I have no idea, but yeah, basically, um, I mean you, if you go with the, the desktop client or the computer client, you know, you download that and it gives you an address off the bat, but you can create new addresses. And so for example, I have a uh, dozen different addresses for different purposes. You know, like if, I, if I'm raising money for a customer, I create a different address and I, I, I label it in my client, you know, so that I know that the payments that come in on that address are for that customer, you know, so it doesn't get all mixed up.
you know, with yeah, my that other just stuff. Seem, that just seems like good business sense, if nothing else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because then I could take a, a screenshot. You know, I can, I can, you can search. You can say, okay, customer John Doe, and so I'll type John Doe, and since that's in the label, all of the transactions for that customer show up right in my Bitcoin client. I can screenshot that, and you know, the customer can do the math to make sure that I, I sent them the right amount of money. Yeah, yeah. So Philippe mentioned a bunch of other stuff here that I didn't really look into um, a whole lot. Like I tried to look them up so at least I knew what he was talking about. But I don't have a, a whole lot to say about these individual things that he mentioned. Yeah. I you liked, know, he mentioned I, these – he mentioned lean principles. I don't know if you're familiar with those or at all. A little bit, yeah. I, well, actually, I have to say I just heard about the whole lean startup thing and I have it on my – in my learning um, – I have a whole learning queue, and so it's in my learning queue now. But I have okay. read Tim Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week. And I'm I curious, Kate, what did you think about that? I think Just that in a quick, um, it's a good book to read, but it's not going to apply to everybody. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, like I tried to, I tried to look it up, and I, you know, I came across everything, you know, marketing for this book kind of thing, and Wikipedia actually had like a rough outline of what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was kind of interesting because he's selling this idea of the four hour work week, but it sounded like a lot of it was outsourcing your work to other people who apparently don't get to work a four hour work week. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he, I think his approach is very capitalistic um, and very relies a lot on the division of labor, which is um, is decent. I, I don't I'm not sure I necessarily have a problem with it. Um I don't but, either. But also, I just... yeah, but also he doesn't actually claim to only work four hours a week. He is he, what he's saying is that he spends four hours on producing or maintaining his income stream or something like that. Okay. So even the title is a little bit gimmicky. Um, yeah, the whole thing struck me as a big gimmick, but it just it 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 kind of struck me that you know he's trying to sell this idea of a 4 hour work week but the idea is that you get a 4 hour work week but some other guys basically doing your work for you. Yeah. So I just thought it was kind of funny that you know in theory if you go to sell this idea it's applicable to everybody. You know everybody could have like, you know when I first saw the title I thought oh everybody can have a 4 hour work week and then when I found out what it was about it was the no 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 you farm your work off to somebody else who's going to work 60 hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it is possible, like everything, like everything, you know, like the, the sky's the limit for everybody, literally. But the fact is that um, most people do not actually believe that. And so they put walls in place in their own minds. And so they relegate themselves voluntarily to the ranks of those people who work 60 hours a week instead of shooting for something better. Yeah, you're probably. I mean, you're probably right. There's probably a lot to be learned from it, at least. I I think it's it's the uh, for for me the takeaway was systematize business, um, focus on what you're really good at, what you really like, and outsource. You know, take advantage of the which is basically capitalism. I mean, uh, capitalistic basic principle. Take advantage of the division of labor uh, to mult as a force multiplier for your profitability. And, um, you know, that, that's basic. Yeah. I, th I thought it was an interesting insight that he picked up on the 80, 20 rule, mm -hmm. you know, that 80% of your time is spent doing 20, you know, producing 20% of your output and vice versa. You know, you produce 80% of your output with 20% of your time. And so he was like, focus on that 20% and do that really well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, you know, that's, and that's, that's not a new idea by, by all means. It's just, he's very good at marketing and putting those ideas together in ways that, uh, capture people's attention. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I, did it for me. But I did, I, I liked one comment of Phil, another comment of Philippe's where he says, you know, let's show some love to each other just to demonstrate that we are not alone. Um, and I think that that is something that we need to pay a little more attention to, because I th I see a lot of people in the community who feel very alone and are, are suffering because of that. Yeah, I saw Josh made a similar or comment kind of along those lines. Josh Plotkin. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so about focusing on yourself first kind of thing, um, which is I mean, it's, you know, it's not showing love to other people, but I think it was kind of had the same kind of feel to it. Um and then, you know, kind of get right with yourself, I think, was kind of a long, kind of where he was going with that. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then but the community stuff there was another there was another lady who posted stuff about um, community gardens and cooperative child care systems and she seemed to be kind of going along the community idea yeah mariana uh says that uh, more cooperative child care systems uh freeing teenagers from the prison of school so they can um learn and participate in society so apprenticeships uh massive community gardens to free people from the burdens associated with our current food system and uh i i i like these ideas this these are very uh like villagey uh almost tribal you know to take it to an extreme and i thought they sounded right up your alley <laughs> um and very very practical and i think very relevant to people who are stuck in uh you know like debt slavery and wage slavery uh, because mm-hmm. you know you these people are you know often these days it's you know if it's uh if it's still a cup you know if the there's a couple there they both have to work and so the kids are, uh, you know, sent out, sent out to school and daycare. And I think that it's, um, for example, in, you know, I think a lot of kids would, would high teenage teenagers would benefit from, uh, you know, more apprenticeships. I know that in high school, I think that I could have done uh, something like that, and it would have been really useful to, to me to get some real world experience. But I was locked into learning all a lot of the same stuff, really, over and over again um, in school. And I like the the community art uh, gardens idea because um, you know I think that if people can produce more of their own food, uh, they're going to be healthier, and so they're going to have more energy to do other things and a clearer mind. At the same time, uh, there are people who uh, who are like you know, hey, I got my homestead, you know, I got my farm, you know. Uh, I got my solar panels and this is, you know, this is, I'm drawing an imaginary line around my little paradise and Hey, everything's good. Uh, see I'm you. I'm taking care of me. Yeah. See you. Um, see you never guys. Leave me alone. <laughs> job. The Bye. mini Galt's Gulch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think that's, um, on the one hand, it's certainly admirable, but on the other hand, it's self delusional to think that, um, you're going to achieve liberty or be able to um, protect yourself in isolation. And it's a little bit ironic as well because capitalism, uh, you know, the free market and whatnot, it's all, all about the network effect and the division of labor and trade. And so if you're off there all, all by yourself, like, leave me alone or I'm going to shoot mm-hmm. you. Don't put your toe over my line, you know. <laughs> and so you're like you're you're totally ignoring the whole network effect of the fact that we're in communication and we're trading uh ideas and products and services all the time. That's that's what makes us strong, you know. If we're all off by ourselves in our tiny little corners, you know, with our itchy trigger fingers on our <laughs> shotguns, you know, uh I mean that's that's like shooting ourselves in the head. Literally almost. <laughs> yeah. I mean, especially if you're, you know, your finger gets tired. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, but I, but I think Josh is right on, you know, the next step is for everyone to meditate and find inner peace before they attempt to change the outside world. Josh Pluck. And because a lot of, and this ties in with my thing that, which I kind of harp on a lot about people having a positive attitude because a lot of people have a negative attitude and they don't believe that, you know, any any or very little, very much improvement is possible. And so they don't try it. And they're just, you know, on a day to day thing and the work and the TV and you know, the kids and, and then you know, the I, next thing again tomorrow. I told you, I think I told you a couple of times or mentioned on here that I follow Jeffrey Tucker on Facebook. I don't know if you do or if you see mm-hmm. some of his posts. He I made do. a comment about this just last week. I don't know if you saw it or not. I'm not sure. Um, Maybe. So I guess somebody on Reddit asked a question, you know, like, why is this guy so optimistic all the time? And I've kind of thought that in the back of my mind. And he wrote a longish Facebook post. I mean, it was probably a few paragraphs, but I mean, it's long as far as Facebook posts go. You know, they're usually a sentence or two long kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was it was actually interesting to read it because I'd never heard anybody say what you just said before reading what he said last week. And it was basically that you know, the state wants and thrives on pessimism because those people don't look at what they can change and how they can make it different. Hmm. And, you know, if you're optimistic about things, you're always looking for, how can I make this better? How can I make it different? And, you know, he kind of went on to, um, talk about the market and, you know, this, 
when people are optimistic and they're looking for change, then they come up with, with all kinds of random ideas to do it. And the state can't correct for that kind of, you know, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, they can't, they're not prepared for ideas coming out of left field. You know, if everybody's pessimistic and think there's nothing I can do, I can't change anything, then the status can exercise all sorts of control because they don't need to worry about people straying from the narrow path that's been set out for them. And there are a lot of people out there who are just waiting to see if something better is going to come along. And that's become almost a cliche in our, in our society. And, um, you know, if you don't make something better happen, uh, there's no reason to believe it's just going to come along all by itself. Well, like I said, that was what I was thinking about when I was on my bike. I'm not, I've got, I had, I came up with another idea that I don't want to get into, but that was my thought about this whole, um, garbage truck thing is I was like, here's a way I can not only thumb my nose at the city, <laughs> you know, but also actually, you know, start to provide this business, you know, that, that, you know, is otherwise dominated by the state. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So, so, uh, two more comments from Jake Whitmer, Whit Whitmer, who's, uh, he's, he comes up with a lot of good ideas. He says, organized jury at rights activism. Um, and th this has been his thing for several years, and I've actually participated in this as well. Um, uh, basically the, uh, this exploits the idea that, uh, jurors can judge, uh, not just the facts of a case, but also the law itself. And they can say that, yeah, we don't think this is a good law. And so even though, you know, you prove that the guy actually did it, you know, you prove that the guy actually sold marijuana, for example, but we don't think that marijuana should be illegal. So we're going to find him not in uh, not guilty. And, um, you know, and he can walk, you know. Yeah, he mentioned having access to court records and stuff like that. So I was I didn't follow his comment. I wasn't sure if he was talking specifically about nullification or he was talking about more app open, open access to records and things that like judges and prosecutors have access to. Yeah, I'm not sure about that either. But I do think that jury rights activism um, or some call it uh, jury independence or um, jury nullification or FIJA um, is or fully informed jury association. Yeah, I think those it's valuable. But at the same time, it's high risk because uh, a lot of people uh, get arrested over that. Uh, I got arrested over it. Uh, Julian Heiklin, you know, was uh, basically fled the country because. He felt that they were, they were, you know, he'd been arrested. They, he, would, he was such a thorn in their side that um, they were setting him up to go in uh, to prison for the rest of his life. Uh, mm -hmm. he's, a, he's an older gentleman. He's about 80 now, I think. Um, Mark Schmitter spent 100 and some odd days in, uh, in prison in Florida because he was uh, just exercising his First Amendment right to hand out these pamphlets uh, near a courthouse. Um, so it, it's, it's dangerous. Uh, so I think it's, it's one of those things that I think all Jake, good ideas are right. <laughs> yeah. But I think Jake would say that there are ways to do it that are safer. And, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, t I've talked to people randomly about it and, you know, just, you know, you don't have to go out in public necessarily to do it necessarily to do it. But, you know, every time I get stuck with jury duty, I always make a point of being like, you know, this is the only reason I go do jury duty is so that I can get some guy off on some bogus charge. People are like, well, what are you talking about? You know, and I always explain to them, you know, the idea of jury nullification and that there's basically, you know, the jury can do whatever it wants and there's no law set up to come back after the jurors if they find in, con you know, in contra whatever to the law is hmm. to whatever the law is you know and they're always like oh really i had no idea about that you know and so you can you can do it without standing in front of a courthouse and handing out pamphlets even yeah um, but i wanted to mention i had a discussion with a friend of mine because um the zimmerman case just happened i know the jurors are from that case are starting to come out and be you know to say like oh this guy got away with murder but uh. we couldn't convict him and i was kind of like you know, it's most people probably wouldn't apply it in this situation, but I was like, that's exactly what jury nullification is for. You know, if you think that this guy killed this other person, you should have found him guilty. That is so uh, low class and cheap to vote one way and then to come out and be like, you know, I, I you know, I mean, just totally contradict oneself. I mean, that's right. Well, that was like I said, that's what I'd understand. I was like, you're, you know, you're in there in the jury room. I mean, essentially, juries can't, I mean, nobody likes to say it, but they can do basically whatever they want. 
Yeah. You know, if they, if they think that, you know, they saw the evidence and they think this guy killed this other person, that's the way they should have voted. Hmm. You know, if there's a law that gets this guy off, but you think that that law is bad, you should vote against that law. Yeah. You know, now and this I, I like the I like the nullification argument um just because I think that's a way to not play by the rules. Hmm. Uh, and that was kind of there was another um, I think Mark Whiteside made comments about um, making public service jobs pay less, localizing entitlement programs, kind of those kind of things. And I think those are good ideas, but I think you have to play by the state's rules in order to make those things happen. Yeah, I love the idea about making government jobs pay less. I think they should pay zero. Yeah, I, I agree, but I think <laughs> but the problem is you need to get the people who are collecting those salaries to reduce their own salary. I mean, essentially oh, you have to pl- you have to play by their rules, and I don't think there's a lot of that you're gonna you're gonna put in a lot more effort. I think than you're going to see than you're going to get out any benefit when you have to play by their rules. Yeah, I think Mark um, would you know, without <laughs> sounding too arrogant, I hope <laughs> needs a little remedial education, you know. <laughs> Dr. George uh, is issuing you a prescription to listen to the show every week. So, <laughs> so yeah, I like, I, yeah, I mean, like you said, you know, I like the idea and we both agree with it. I just, I don't think you're going to make it happen without playing by the state. I mean, you essentially have to go and vote and play by the state's rules in order to achieve that end. Yeah. And I don't and, think there's any value in playing by the state's rules. And instead of doing that, let's just work on building up, uh, you know, an alternate power base. I mean... Yeah. Well, and and the other thing, too, is I, you know, I said, you know, if you don't like politicians, you know, make that job despicable kind of thing. You know, don't associate with them. Don't associate with people who do, who participate in that stuff. That's, Mm -hmm. you know, that's the libertarian way. Yeah. (laughs) So the last comment is from John Kennedy. And he says, libertarians need to shift efforts from the production of public goods to the production of private goods. Libertarians recognize that private profit drives the engines of prosperity Yet in pursuit of liberty, they typically thrash around with approaches that don't profit the individual. I took notes on each of these questions, and my notes for this question said, I don't understand this comment, or each comment. <laughs> so yeah, I, I didn't even understand what he was saying. You know, I guess I would have needed an example to follow. Uh, I think that basically with 50 Cent Words, he's saying, uh, you know, agorism, we need to focus on, um, you know, producing... Uh, private goods and serv- privately goods and services that uh, enhance our own pri- profiles. You know, so we need to engage in entrepreneurialism. You know, we we need to go out there and solve problems and be of service to people so that we can make money, so that we can uh, be more prosperous instead of uh, thrashing around with things like uh, in-your-face uh, jury rights activism that gets you arrested. Instead of going into Freedom Plaza and cocking a shotgun, you know, instead of, uh, you know, going out there and uh, smoking marijuana and, you know, and and getting cited for that. And of course, I don't, you know, I have friends who do all these things. I've done it myself. And I don't want to like attack them personally at all because I think it requires a lot of courage to do all these things. But inevitably, whenever I, you know, looking back on myself as well, I think a lot of these things where people go up against the state, you know, and they're like, you know, fuck you, you know, uh, I'm going to do this. I don't care if you arrest me. I think a lot of that boils down to ego, to building one's own ego and one's own uh, level of respect inside the community. You know, like, hey, I got arrested now. You guys have got to, you know, resp- I got my street cred. You can respect me more now. Um, and... Uh, and what what in the end what happens is we become a community that revolves around people with the biggest egos who can create the most drama instead of actually doing what we say we want which is uh producing and inevitably uh and you know this you know I'm sure that anyone who's listening who is an individualist or uh you know tends that way you know or an, an egoist an Ayn Rand egoist inev- inevitably when you're in order to produce value and get paid, you first have to help other people. And so we need to like bury our egos a little bit and be more, yes, dare I say, service oriented. We need to serve other people, ourselves and people outside the community, because that's the way that you make money. And as our own individual wealth profiles improve, 
that increases our power, our power base. And that really is the path forward, in my opinion. Yeah, I think you, I think you hit on that. I think you're right. I think you can also engender a lot of goodwill to your cause, to yourself, and to your cause by serving other people. Yeah, because you know that that American ethic that respects the inventor and the entrepreneur and the person who gives good service and whatnot that is still there in a lot of places. In fact, I think that. It's rarer than ever to find people who are genuinely service oriented and want to give you uh, and want to actually engage in the kind of capitalism we talk about, which is where, you know, you give uh, a greater value in return for a lesser payment, you know, depending on your, your perspective. I mean, like the customer gets something of great value and they give less than what than than what it's worth to them so they profit from it you know right they and wouldn't have made capitalism. the trade otherwise right yeah i mean that's free trade but in the, today's world so many people are you know corporations are cost cutting and whatnot and raising prices and there's inflation and so more often than not you know you go to buy something and you're like damn this is too high this price is too high and this quality sucks but i have to buy it anyway because i need it and this is the only place where I can get it, you know. And there's only one product. Uh, so. Yeah, and Mark's Mark's comment kind of went to that, you know, that we needed to change the culture away from this cheap and disposable to more to quality and long lasting. Yeah, and I think you you kind of started my my only problem with that is I don't see that that excuse me I don't see that that's a problem necessarily. You know, his his comments seem to have kind of an anti corporation kind of bent to it. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that as a as a corporate America problem. I mean, in, in my opinion, it seems like the, go the government is busy devaluing the currency, which is what's driving prices up. And corporations are trying to meet the demand for lower costs or at least curb rising rising prices by making cheaper products. So well, well that and, I'm not, and also real wages are stuck at like 1970 levels. Right. So I, I don't think that corporations are the problem, which is kind of what my takeaway from his comment that he was pointing the finger at corporations in this particular for this particular problem. And in my opinion, it's actually the government devaluing the currency. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, like you talk about wages. I mean, there's there's a huge shift, it seems like, to you shift the money from, you know, workers to corporations and banks and Wall Street and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just wanted to stick up for corporations because, like I said, that kind, the comment in particular had kind of a, yeah. I mean, I guess I probably that was probably a bad phrasing of, <laughs> of words. But let me get to the end here. And I was basically going to say, you know, in a pure capitalist sense, a corporation is nothing but a group of individuals. Mm. You know, so he kind of it seemed like he kind of in you know. So when I say corporations, that's kind of the way I'm using that word. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want you know. I kind of wanted to bring that his comment back a little bit you know it's not necessarily corporations that are the problem it's their protection from the government and the state privilege that they get that is the problem yeah well we're we're way over maybe we can talk about the the that that corporation you know who's the bad guy the corporation or the government maybe that could be our topic for next week Sounds good. Yeah, I, I I really enjoyed the show. Yeah, like I know we've been way over, but I I thought the conversation was actually been going very very. It's been very interesting, which is why I haven't been real 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 quick to stop us this time, like I usually am. Yeah, because John's usually the guy who's like, you know, ding ding ding, time's over. <laughs> shut up, George. Shut up. <laughs> so maybe we can get some feedback from one of our three listeners if they actually listen all the way through about how they liked it. Yeah, guys, you should really take turns. You know, one week, one of you calls, and the next week, the next one calls. You know, I mean, come on, guys. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, I certainly enjoyed our conversation today, and I hope you have as well.